Welcome to Art Shouts. And our guest today is Wendy Bellew, <laughs> who is with Reforming Arts, uh, a program that works with women in prisons. And uh, I'm so glad to have you here, Wendy. I am so glad to be here with you today, Alice. Wendy was also the Arts Exchange 2019 uh, Art and Social Justice uh, Champion and for her work. At, so I want to start off with talking about how you got involved with the working with the prison art program. Right. So, you know, I was saying that, you know, it was a major transition in my life. In 2009, I, um, I just kind of received this call. I say a call from God and it just was prison. It, that was it. And that it happened about two weeks after I visited my father uh, in prison in um, Huntsville, Texas. And he's been a resident there. The, his Senate started there this time in 86, but he had only been out of prison for nine months um, in his previous sentence. So basically my whole life, my father's been in prison and I didn't really know him. And I went to visit him and um, it was the first time I'd seen him in 33 years. And uh, it had a major impact on me that I didn't, and that I didn't know. And one of the things that I thought about during that time, I'd not read anything about prisons or anything was that, that he could not be summed up by the worst thing or things that he had ever done. It was a complicated person and, and he was my father. Um, and so again, two weeks later, like I just hear this like, like message from like just prisons and I didn't know what that meant. I thought it meant chaplaincy. Like I was going to have to go to seminary. And then, um, I realized, my first week teaching, my first day teaching theater in prison, that it was not, there was not a call to seminary. It was not a call to chaplaincy. <laughs> I was never going to be an employee of the Department of Corrections. <laughs> um, and so that's how we got started. And so I called, uh, after I heard that, I was like, well, what do, what are my skills? At the time I had an MBA and an undergraduate in theater. So when I reached out to Andrea Shelton at Heartbound Ministry saying, how do I, how do I start volunteering? She's like, what do you, what can you do? And I was like, oh, and so I told her my degrees and she said, oh, well, you're going to teach a theater class. And I said, but I'm a stage manager. Of course, she didn't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a manager that has been directing and teaching all these 11 years and um, it's been mostly wonderful. It's a very intense and um, challenging work, working in prisons. And I've, could you talk a bit about the, the challenges that you faced in that work? Well, I think everybody faces challenges working in the work. I, I think in particular, Reforming Arts has, because I'm, I'm their leader um, and I'm gender nonconforming and uh, pretty butch, um, has been, hard it's been harder for us and it's been harder because you know again i grew up in southern baptist tradition very fundamentalist and so i notice the religiosity in a different way than other people do and i see it as and i'm from the 14th district so i see it as my whole life i've known those people and see that religiosity is very dangerous actually as we see we've seen in the last year as the whole nation has seen in the last year but um, so I've been saying that for about 11 years and I've get, gotten a lot of resistance for that. And so, I mean, it, there's challenges of just like the Department of Corrections, they know they, uh, they want programs, but the facilities have to run the, uh, the programs and the facilities don't receive the funding that they need to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a disconnect and that makes it hard on everyone, including the staff at the prison. And it makes it almost impossible for the volunteers. Um, and it makes it impossible to, to have a true partnership with the Department of Corrections because so many of them don't, you, you know, they see they're overworked. So they just see you as a problem versus some uh, somebody providing a free service, a yeah. valuable free service. I know it's also very difficult to get into prisons when you talk about the religiosity. They're much more open and uh, engaging with religious organizations to come in and proselytize to the to the uh, inmates. But when you talk about bringing them enrichment programs, it's almost as if they have an attitude that they don't deserve 
the enrichment programs. But I think the unique thing about your program that I love so much is that it's not only theater, but you also educate them at the same time. So the idea that you begin with the theater program working on the recidivism. Yes, and I, I'll, I'll ask you, uh, Alice, to, to refer to our students and people that are incarcerated as people of uh, people that are incarcerated and not as inmates. Um, I know it's a, a switch in language, but um, so yeah, we start with a theater, we call it a theater, in, well, we used to call it theater infused um, uh, liberal arts, but now, and you know, in addition to this, I, a lot of people don't know, while I've been doing reforming arts, I've been in grad school just about the whole time. Wow. So when I started, I was doing a Amer master's in American studies and I'm ABD now, in, um, which is all but dissertation, in a, a qualitative research and evaluation um, PhD at University of Georgia. And so during this time, I've also adapted or kind of looked at device theater through a feminist lens. And so we've created a pedagogy that we call creative interactive pedagogy uh, slash theater. And it's a applied theater and it really encompasses these um, um, the art, you know, the transdisciplinary, or you know, and a smaller word, you know, many. We look at many disciplines. For example, I'm tr maybe I'm trying to recreate myself. I don't know, but I have <laughs> a degree. I have a business uh, master's in business, a master's in American studies, a certificate in women's studies, and now this education a PhD. And so, and what I've discovered by studying so many different disciplines is that we're all talking about the same theories uh, <laughs> in each discipline. Maybe business has a few other people we, that they listen to, uh, but um, but they're still looking at uh, the same, you know, enlightenment or versus pause, you know, the, the whole line of it. So we need to make connections across fields and we need to, uh, and I hope that that is what uh, reforming arts is doing is fostering creative critical thinking because creative thinking is wonderful critical thinking is wonderful but i really believe that if people the way technology is the way our world is right now in order to be able to thrive in the future not just, uh, everyone is going to have to be or not people that are creative critical thinkers are going to be the ones that not only survive but thrive um, when automation is has taken over. I, I totally agree with you. And I appreciate you correcting me. You're right. And, and, and I'll self-correct myself because I'm also particular about language. And you're so right. These are people who are incarcerated. They are not a, a, a tagline uh, for a politician to use uh, to beat across the head. And we need to be reminded that these are people, you know, mm -hmm. that they have families, that they like you said when you started, that they're serving this time, but this is not the sum total of who they are as human beings, you know. And I totally agree with the creativity, which is what makes art so powerful, that um, if you are creative, uh, that's, you know, this is what we call the mother of invention, you know, uh, you get creative, you can come up with a way out of any situation, you think your way through it. Right. Talk about, talk about the program that you started with those women who came out of the system and uh, you begin to work with them to tell their stories. Right. So in 2013, we started our theater reentry project. And um, I'll tell you, it's been it's been the hardest thing that we've done. Mm. And 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 I I say that even with having PTSD from my time, you know, from teaching inside the prisons um, and um, but it's because I'm watching these folks that were, I know how smart they are. I know how capable they are. And I did not know, and they did not know how traumatic uh, reentry is. Mm. And it's not, and it's not just because of the lack of housing and jobs and support. It's that it, people are being ripped out of like, they fantasized about this thing that is going to be so traumatic to them because they're ripped out of their support system. And they're not really allowed to contact those people. And they're, and 
their and their families don't know how traumatized they are and don't realize how traumatized they are. And so it's been very difficult. Uh, Re-entry has been um, emotionally difficult for me because it is so difficult for the, for the um, re-entering citizens. I, even though all of our students lived in a women's facility, I don't identify them all. They don't necessarily identify as women, all of them. So I, I try to say, our students, I, I do want to make it clear that we do solely work um, in the women's facility or water facilities. So, I, um, but it's been difficult. And what we've done is uh, we bring our uh, alumni together and, and other formerly incarcerated people that were in women's facilities. Um, and they write plays about their struggles with reentry. And we tour those. Um, most we at first we just were going to college campuses. Our purpose there was to talk to these college students. We did it like a thirty-minute performance, and then use, required a at least a forty-five-minute talk back, so that the students could engage with the participants and really ask questions. And then we uh, started. Sent, we'll send um, information packets to the instructor before we come to the class so that and and including things like it's none of your business what they did or what prison is really like uh, that's not what we're here for right that's just voyeurism um, and so we did a uh, 2014 uh, uh, Kennesaw State University did a um, research study for us that did a pre-performance and a post-performance impact analysis mm -hmm. and asking four questions ar around housing, friendship, um, and employment. If, if these students would um, rent to or hire a formerly incarcerated person. And the change, the change in responses was enormous. It was, it was a complete, almost a complete flip in people's wow. attitude after the performance. Which is the power of understanding someone's story. That when well, you started off at these are human beings and once you understand their story, then you have to look at them differently and you have to assess them differently. But it's interesting that people never think about how difficult it is to leave that uh, that uh, prison setting and come back out into this broader world where they know there are so many obstacles placed in their way, but then also about the relationships left behind because you do have to form your own family in order to survive in that setting. So what do you, what do you think um, beyond the, the performances you take out to the public and telling the stories of these formerly incarcerated individuals, what do you think the public should know about the role they play in helping to change prisons and attitudes towards the formerly incarcerated? Well, I, I, I do think if you can, you know, do a little Google search, the AJC, um, the Atlanta Journal Constitution has finally started reporting on what has been happening inside the Georgia prisons for the last year. You know, I'm a, I'm a volunteer and I can't, I need to maintain that status, so I can't say too much, but the Southern Center for Human Rights and the Atlanta Journal Constitution has started really trying to inform the public about what the last year has been. I really think we need some political, um, political uh, public, I don't know, influence um, towards that. The governor said that he's going to increase after after this governor has decreased the department's budget by 25 percent over the last three years. Now he's saying he's going to give them a 10 percent the um, staff a 10 percent raise, and that's going to be like some kind of stopgap after everybody has quit. They lost 98 percent of their new employees last year. People wow. that and people won't stay, and people weren't staying before. Because it's a very, it's a very toxic, you know, how they train them is very toxic. It's very, you know, violent. And um, so they're, the Department of Corrections has been understaffed the whole 10 years I've been involved. But it is at a critical 
mass right now. And quite frankly, the people that are still working there, God bless them because, mm. you know, they're not being tested. They're not, be, you know, they've, they've had two people, two staff members die of COVID and they're still not doing mass testing. Um, 88 uh, people who are incarcerated have died. 27 murders last year, uh, 10 at one prison. Um, so these are, these are things that are not like, um, I don't know why the National Guard or, you know, the federal government is not in, quite frankly. Um, and I hope I don't get kicked out of prison for saying that, but um, it, I, I'm, I'm very concerned about yes. our students right now on the inside. I'm also very concerned about our students, our, form, our alumni, and what we need there and what we're going to kind of pivot to a little bit we can't say there's just we can't say anymore that we, we don't that reforming arts doesn't have the capacity for housing because that's the that is the critical need is housing and so you know whether it is in insurance y'all in the sure insurance industry controls so much is what prevents so many people from being able to re-enter successfully because oh. uh you know, every policy I have, I've gotten, you know, even with my auto policy, our commercial auto policy, because we have a van. The question was, is a felon going to drive this van? And I said, oh, wow. why are you asking me that question? You know, there is. And can you tell me the actuary data of how a person with a felony is more likely to have a car accident? I don't think you can. So that is just prejudiciary. And, um, and it's throughout the system. So, uh, you know, being more vocal with your politicians about, you know, proper, if we're, you know, I don't think we should be incarcerating people, but if we are incarcerating people, they should have decent food to eat and they should have electricity and they should, you know, be, if they get sick, they should at least get a test and not be thrown into lockdown. So you brought up a lot of issues. Um, one, I think that's, that's sort of the, packed into that is this um, thirst for over-incarceration, um, that there are other options for people other than being incarcerated, even when there are um, infractions. And the fact that quite often females go to, to prison because, not because of actual sins they committed, but because of their association with people um, that do, and they sort of get pulled in, into it. Um, and even it's so a how do you shift the public attitude? Because when you really um, confront people and talk to them, they often have in their family someone who's been incarcerated, yet they don't seem to have that compassion um, for the incarcerated. Well, I, I really do think that that is this. In, so that's our individualism. And we, we're seeing this individual, oh. the, the toxicity of, of individualism throughout society right now and people's lack of care for each other. And I've, I tell, I've been depressed most of the year because of just watching people's lack of care for each other. And I will say that that is the core of our pedagogy to try to foster that sense of care in people. But um, I... <sighs> I, 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 it's that individualism and I see it inside the, that's our first thing in, in, in our classes is to, to keep that sense of accountability. Yeah. We should have a, a, a sense of accountability and responsibility, Yes. but to, to recognize the systems and the structures that are putting people in prison. And because they, you know, they'll sit in there and say, Oh, I saw this thing, you know, like they're watching a trial or a case on the news or something, a uh, notorious thing. And they're like, oh, she's coming here and blah, blah, blah. And she and this and this about her, this and this about her. And I'm like, well, wait, what did the media say about your case? And they'll say it and I'll say, but and was that true? And they'll say no. And I'll say, well, why do you think that the, what they're saying about this woman is true? To either. And so it's that it's that system of continuing to blame the individual and themselves and uh, instead of the systems. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't have accountability and responsibility. I'm saying it's a combination of the two. 
and um, and that we need to have more compassion for ourselves and compassion for our, our communities. And we need to fund, if we are going to incarcerate people, mm -hmm. we need to fund the system in a way that allows them to retain some of their humanity within that system. And the thing that you brought up about COVID-19, which people don't even think about how deadly it is inside. There are no, there are no stats released about um, infections within the system, uh, the prison system. Uh, I know several young men over the years that I have supported through their time being incarcerated. And so one keeps me regularly updated about the uh, situation in Florida. And they, th there's no isolation. Uh, they group them all in together. It's almost as if they they uh, want them to get it to sort of like diminish the population. That there is no concern for their safety, and I, I agree with you. I think if families understood this, that they might raise their voices a lot louder to make sure that their loved ones, because these are still someone's loved ones, right, or better, were better taken care of. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think it, you know, one of the things that we're thinking about pivoting towards is working more with families to help families understand the trauma that their loved ones have undergone. Um, and, and what I've also recognized is, even though the, the, I'm the head of this organization, right, um, like even our alumni don't understand the impact of someone's incarceration, that the impact that some your incar their incarceration has had on their families. Um, so, you know, I do think that that's a, a um, if we can just have more understanding of each yes. other. Yeah, and uh, it's a big it's a big issue and it's a big problem. And then you talk about it; it's not just um, prisons it goes through the jails through the juvenile justice system it often starts in the juvenile justice system well i mean for a kid to have gotten to the juvenile justice system for example i, I have you know I, I have brilliant friends and clients a lot uh they're brilliant and they were in advanced placement classes in high school but yet they didn't graduate. And, you know, and, but my course teacher texted me like two weeks ago. My high school course teacher texted me two weeks ago um, because she identified me in ninth grade as somebody that she was going to hang out with, <laughs> you know? And she, she led me through and was like, oh, you would be a good, really great arts administrator, you know, when I it was in like a junior in high school and had a huge impact in my life. And she was not the only one. None of us pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. That is just not a thing that happens. And we have to understand that, um, that it, we have to have care for each other. We have to help each other and dehumanizing people and, um, abusing people for years is not going to make them productive citizens. And I've struggled with this sense of prison abolition for a long time because I came to this in a much different perspective than a lot of people. My father, there are very few serial violent offenders in the prison system. My father is one of those people. Mm -hmm. And, um, I have struggled with abolition because I'm like, well, what do you do with people like my father? And I still don't know the answer to that question, but I know this is not the solution. I know that continuing to abuse abused people is not this, uh, any solution to making a better, healthier society. So there's a lot of work that we have to do, um, legislative wise, uh, being in touch with our local politicians and letting them know that this is an issue that we care about, educating ourselves about what is truly happening behind those walls and what life is like, and finding ways to assist people when they leave those institutions to actually have a healthy, productive lives. Can you tell us one of your one of your good 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 uh, time stories? something that worked really well for one of your? your well, kids. I would just say that, you know, one of our, uh, I think y'all, I don't know, 
some people have seen Shannon. Some people haven't. We have a, We hired our, our uh, first employee this year, and um, she has been. She has two certificates from Reforming Arts, uh, uh, associate's degree from Life University. They began a program um, in prison several years ago, and uh, is our reentry navigator. And um, it's been a it's been a difficult struggle for her, right? She was in prison for twenty five years. Oh, yeah. And um, even just the technology, the technology gap, y'all. It's like 1995. She went to prison in nineteen ninety five. Mm. And um, so it's been a struggle, uh, but she is uh, ultimately do doing well. And um, so to for her to be. And I won't say she was prepared to re-enter, um, but we're we're working through it. And I'll just say, any time somebody comes out of that really oppressive system and is able to not just survive but to thrive in their lives, is is a, a miracle. I agree. Totally agree. I. I have a son who works in in uh, the justice system, who sit on the national committees. was the was the commissioner of juvenile justice in Kentucky for five years, and does a lot of training with the staffs. And he talks to them about being hope dealers. He says that what people need more than anything are hope dealers in their life, and particularly the people within these institutions. That they have to come and know that they have to bring with them some idea of hope for the for a life beyond the current situation and that this is the way to uplift all of us in our society because mm -hmm. when you diminish one you diminish us all and that is this is what the 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 system does and then i tell you my my good luck story i have a nephew who who was incarcerated um very serious crimes and he had been an artist from a little child he, spent a lot of time with me and my family and we always encouraged all our kids to get involved with the arts. So I sent him art supplies and art saw him through. When he got out, that's what he did. He did his artwork and and he continued to work with young people uh, from what he had learned. And ultimately this young man um, got a full scholarship to St. Louis University, um, left there, got a full scholarship for his master's at Washington University and became the first black man to graduate with a doctorate from Washington University in 25 years. So I know that, like you say, these are brilliant people. A mistake should not follow you all your life and a mistake should not define you, that we all have the capacity to grow. And what I love about the creativity and what you're doing is that art is one of the most powerful ways for self-awareness and creative thinking and for, for and for growth, for personal growth. Right. Do you have plans to expand any of your arts programming? We that's a great question. And and, and we it was not pre-talked about. <laughs> but it is a great question <laughs> because we are pivoting a big uh, we are laying the groundwork to pivot. Uh, we are not going to stop working in the prisons uh, as, lo as long as they allow us to do so. But this year has taught us that we can't be dependent on the Department of Corrections um, for our solely dependent on them for our programming. And our and our pedagogy is almost ready uh, to to release to the world. And so we're going to uh, we're our plan is to, yes, expand, start offering more uh not you know an associate's degree, but like workshops in creative, uh, um, uh, interactive pedagogy. See, I don't even remember the name of it yet. Uh, <laughs> we hope to, we hope to work in more uh, in um, uh, work with more pe people, women who have been in domestic violence shelters yes. with the people who are experiencing homelessness um you know even church I, I i believe everybody needs this um sense of care and this ethics of care um and this creative critical thinking so yes we're going to start um training 
keep uh, providing trainings and workshops um, in this um, device theater, feminist device theater uh, through reforming arts. So I think that what you're saying is critical when you talk about how integrated it is, because I think people don't understand that no matter what job they do, and what walk of life they come from, they have something that they could contribute to these creative programs, that um, creativity comes in many forms and critical thinking is something that crosses all fields. So what kind of volunteers are you looking for and how can people get involved with you? That, so I appreciate that you said that because I think, you know, people, people that are coders, programmers are some of the most creative oh. people, right? Like we do need create, you know, creativity uh, and volunteers. We're also trying to implement, you know, so during this time we've really worked to, um, grow our re-entry program where we're meeting with folks virtually and trying to offer them more resources um but we have our prison to school to college pipeline that we're we're working on that we're we're realizing when people are coming out they need many mentors they they need people to help them um uh, coach them on how to be an employee they need people to coach them on, uh, you know, like the professional behaviors, uh, tech, the technology gap, um, you know, how to dress. So we need volunteers um, right now. Oh, mentors uh, is a yeah. big thing that we need. Uh, we are looking to hire uh, instructors uh, in visual arts and theater. Um, because we offer, we were in the inside, and we're, and of course, we're not going to be back on the inside until at least the fall. But on the wow. uh, inside program and on our outside program, we're we're uh, offering. We offer too many arts classes uh, to count for their associate's degree, and so we pay those um, instructors out of our pocket, and and we are looking for them, and we're particularly looking for folks in Middle Georgia. Excellent, excellent. I, people can go to the website, uh, reformingarts.org or com? Dot org. Dot org, reformingarts.org. Mm -hmm. And I know that there is a link there where you can sign up to be a volunteer. Uh, people need information about financial planning, how to manage their finances. Um, I mean, just so many cooking, you know, uh, yeah. and things, things that are also fun, not just things that are that we think of as uh, fundamental. Well, but to bring some joy and some uh, creativity, as you say, creativity is everywhere. That's right. I, I've been amazed at what I've had to teach people to do over the last decade, you know, and I, I never thought I'd be a driving instructor. I never, <laughs> I, <laughs> yes. <laughs> to 30 year olds, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah. So I, I can imagine that your heart is really going out to the um, the the individuals that you left behind because you said you know you're, we're not able to do that face to face work anymore, and um, what would you what and I I know that's a very difficult thing that you're not able to to see them and to be with them. Um, my last interview was with Bill Cleveland who started a arts program in San Quentin prison uh, 30 years ago. And that was one of the things that the inmates said to him. He says, well, what are we gonna do when you're gone? So um, my heart goes out to, to those who are still there and waiting for their opportunity to re-engage with you and to re-engage with the world. You know, So what, what would you like to leave our, our audience with this evening? Well, and, and they're liking, to, they want to re-engage with their families too. Like they haven't had a visit, been able to visit with their families face-to-face -face for almost a year also. And that's very difficult and it's understandable. So, you know, I, I would say, you know, if we have any um, families of incarcerated people right now, uh, you know, the loved ones, it's just, you know, more cards and, and, and just compassion and, and um and and for the general public like again like if, if we could get to a point where we can see the person and the, and their capabilities and not, not a label or a background check or or things like that like people are coming out well people just want a chance and we call it a second chance 
but I don't think most of these folks ever had a first chance. Mm. Yes. So I want to thank you, Wendy, for joining us today. And I want to remind uh, people some of the things Wendy's re recommended. She mentioned an AJC article, Atlanta Journal Constitution article, which has begun to talk about some of the issues within the Georgia prison system. So that's a good place to begin to educate yourself. Uh, reach out to your local politicians. Let them know that this is an issue you care about. Reach out to the governor's office and let him know that this is something that you want to see funded so that people are people should not die because they are incarcerated and this is a time when people are dying purely because they are incarcerated because they're not getting medical care they're not getting ppe and they're not being uh segregated from those people who become ill so these are things that your voice could make a big difference and then of course when people are re-entering they need your support they need your they need your support. They need you to stand beside them and behind them to push them onward and upward. And I congratulate you, Wendy, in finding a place to express all of your full self <laughs> and uh, to bring all of your gifts to a community that really needed your gifts and continues um, to need your gifts. And I'm, I'm wishing you guys all the best. You can visit reformingarts.org to find out more about the organization. Uh, and get involved with it. And I want to thank you again for joining us on the podcast, Art Shots. Thank you, Alice.